lecture of this uh, SciTech Spins lecture series. Um, today we have Professor uh, Ravi Krishnan Langovan from Department of Biotechnical Engineering and Biotechnology, and he would be speaking on something very interesting: um, learning biology with digital microscope. You'll talk about this digital microscope that they have developed. He's also a co-founder of Valitude Primus Healthcare. Um, and I'm sure uh, you would be more interested to learn about what he has to say from him than me. Uh, I would talk a little bit without taking too much time on the program itself. Um, this, this, this initiative was started by um, Professor Somik and the academic outreach team here at IIT Delhi almost a year back, uh, since then, uh, which was then headed by Professor Pratha Chandra uh, as an Associate Dean of Academic Outreach and New Initiatives. Um, I am the current holder of that position. Um, so in case if you have to reach out, you know uh, who you have to bug, that's me. Uh, Professor Somik uh, has been coordinating for the past one year or so, um, and all the lectures that have taken place uh, has happened under his coordinatorship. Of course, uh, the team also involved Renu and Gaurav, who are uh, the staff members associated with Academic Outreach and New Initiatives Unit. With that, I will stop boring you and let uh, Professor Elangevin take over and explain the exciting stuff. Uh, they are just putting a little bit of pressure on me. Huh? Very good morning. Uh, I hope everybody can hear. Yes. yes sir. Good, good. So, I add some little bit of uh, nostalgia for me and this place. So I actually also studied in IIT Delhi, so this classroom used to be one of the ones I used to sit for longer times and uh, have lots of good lectures here. And uh, I used to sit in the last two benches. Fortunately today it's empty, so good. So lectures can be hard, right? So. Can we avoid that today? Can we have a small interaction where if we have some questions, we can have communicate to each other? Will be fine. Yeah. So uh, I would like all of you to basically keep answering. I don't go over answers first. It's just fine. So biology. I'm sure that you guys are learning so many new things every class. Some new new concepts are being explored. When you are learning these things, we are want to enhance your learning experience by having something like a digital microscope at your home. Okay, and uh, the information we want you to learn is to see the details of life. Now, see the details of life. Right? So it's how difficult it is to see the details of life. We are already seeing many things, right? So you have your own eyes, the eyes. The, the structure of the eye is something I am sure you must have already covered. So one interesting part of this eye is that you have a lens which basically focuses the light from everywhere and it is basically put on the back side of the nerve. So these nerves have these cells which can actually react to the light hitting on them. And there are some cells which will react to specifically certain colors, some cells which are reacting to intensity. So this is how we are able to see the whole world around us and seeing is one of the very very important sense for us to understand, perceive and even actually move around right. Now when you see with this uh, natural eyes we are already capturing a lot of information but there is some things that we don't see right. So what are the things that we cannot see with our eyes anybody wants to say. You see, hmm? atoms, atoms, molecules, atoms, molecules cells, 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 dark. Dark. We can't see the dark. Correct fact. Why is it? There is no light. This is brilliant, right? So all the things we are seeing is can happen only if there is light. If we have actually completely switch off all the light, so there is we can't see these things, right? So these all the places, individual people, even you are seeing me is because we have the lights which is sitting on myself and it's reflecting. And this reflected eyes are basically focused by your lens to see, right? Now another interesting thing, what else you can say? 
what are the things that we cannot still see? There are some things that are in the smaller dimension. Smaller things. Smaller things we cannot see. Now, what is the smallest thing that you can see? Particle. What is the particle that you use the smallest? Dust particles we can see. Dust particle. Brown ear motion or brown. Very good. So, you have hairs, right? Hair is about 100, 200 microns. The smallest thing that you can see is about 100 microns. What is 100 micron? What is the millimeter? Micron is the size. Yes, size, right? So, meter. You have a meter, I am almost like one and a half meters, right? So, if you can divide the meters, centimeters, centimeters to millimeters, and you can millimeters, you can go down to micrometers. So, 100 micrometer is the smallest size that we are able to see with our God given eyes. Okay. So, this is uh, one of the things that we have to see that lot of life that is happening, particularly biology, they are actually happening in the smaller dimensions. They are less than 100 microns. So, to visualize these things, we need special apparatus like microscopes. And we have many of these things today here. So, you will have an opportunity to look at and see what are the things around it, smaller than this ones. Okay. There is one more thing. Can all the organisms that are available with the eyes, optical senses, do they have the same kind of spectrum? Right. So, we are actually able to see most of the things in the visible spectrum. So, this is also one part that I want you to remember. Okay. Now, something nice tree, it is not a tree, it is what is in our protozoa. Okay. So, this is, what is greenish things that you can see? Algae. Algae. Green algae. Right? Tree of life. What is it? You are supposed to, you promised to be interact with me. Sorry, this is a nerve cell. So, you have your muscle. Muscle is actually one of the things that you have actually longest cells actually. You can start from here and go till your tendons. So, these long tubular cells are activated by your neurons and these are neuronal junctions and these are very long cells that you can see. Okay. Now, coming to this. Is there something different about this image and this image? So, its background is dark and the cells are glowing. Okay. So, this is something called as a fluorescence. So, that is also something we will learn today. How you can actually selectively visualize. So, we are actually normally when you are doing to commercialization, you can see everything by scattering. Scattering is non specific. So, if you want to be specific, we would like to use this kind of things. This might not look very uh, easy on, I don't know whether you are able to see it in the crisp one. This is actually uh, what we do in places like here in IIT. So, you must also wonder like you know what these people are doing in IIT, professors are learning about human biology. This is a 20 neurons that people have visualized at a micrometer resolution and around 2007. So, this was actually uh, very celebratory picture because we are actually always able to see only one neuron at a time. We don't know how these neurons come together and work. So, when using this kind of a microscopy technique, people are able to visualize large number of neurons. Something to scare you guys. Right. So, we also understand how the cells are growing up. Right. So, you want to know basically how one single cell becomes into an organ. There is basically you can have different different types of tissues that they get developed. So, this whole study is being done by a program called developmental biology. 
And so people want to label specifically only the neurons in this animal. So where are the taste bud and neurons that is in the You can see in the eyes, mouth and different different positions. The nerve sections in this complete fish is coming out. Now this is all very exciting things we are learning, right? Yeah. Now to learn these things we need to understand the fundamentals. So if you pay attention to the fundamentals then all the things that we learn will become as a easy and straightforward. Okay. Let's start with our fundamentals. So what is light? So light is a electromagnetic radiation. So what is it? How can you other way explain it? So that means it is basically having a component of a magnetic field, it is having a component of electric field and they are always perpendicular to each other. So this is very important about light. Now the light is actually this kind of a wave thing, right? So it propagates. So you can see that it is actually propagating forward in a particular periodicity. So this is called as a wavelength, okay? So wavelength of a light is a periodicity at which it is traveling forward, okay? Now then you have this property about the light which is actually very interesting that is you can actually exist as a energy and you can also exist as a some kind of a physical form, okay? So meaning that when you are actually seeing this light, they are all propagating together some particular direction and they can be converted, they have some energy and this energy can be absorbed or actually it can be also emitted. So what we are seeing in this kind of filaments in the light system is there is basically high voltage is kept across certain metals and they basically emit light. So these are LEDs, lasers. Now, so the property of this light is that it is always going forward in a particular periodicity. So you can characterize this by the periodicity that is called as a wavelength. Another part is this wavelength can be used to say different types of light. Okay. So what we see mostly is called as a visible spectrum and there are things that is smaller than this one. The visible spectrum is about 400 to 700 nanometers. Very good. Right. Now above 700 what you have is something called as the infrared. So infrared we have heard somewhere, right? Where do we hear the infrared? Huh? Remote control, yes, perfect. Huh? Radio. Infra, uh, radio, radio waves is a little bit larger than the infrared. So you can see here that uh, visible light, you have infrared, you have microwaves which is in the center of and then you have radio waves which is larger. Micro. Now I want us to focus on first thing, infrared. Have you heard of infrared in any, where, in life, where it is? So he said remote control, remote control radio waves is are used. Go on. The James Webb telescope. Yes, some of the telescopes that are used are actually using some of the uh, infrared and radio waves. Uh, I don't know if you have seen these days because of the corona when you are actually going across cross uh, airport or in the uh, uh, railway stations. They monitor people with a camera, right? So those cameras are basically based on infrared rays and they detect the body temperature. So you are actually depending upon how hot the person is that the radio, uh, infrared can be, absorption is different. So that can be used to basically to see people and the temperature profile. So that's one. So if you go down in uh, visible, you have x-rays. I'm sure I, none of you had an opportunity, but X-rays are used for scanning. Scanning, scanning, right? So this is one important thing, right? So when you look at visible light, which is about 400, 500 nanometers, it cannot actually penetrate and cross your hands, right? The X-rays are actually in the wavelength of about few angstroms, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 angstroms. So when you put an x-rays, they are able to cross it. Only the very dense material in your body, which is the bones, they have basically not able to cross it. 
so you are able to use x rays for visualizing bone and many other uh, uh, applications are there so we use we stick to visible spectrum because for us seeing is belief right now another important properties light as i said propagates it has a specific periodicity which is called as a wavelength now if these are basically going if you can see a light it is propagating in this kind of a sinusoidal wave and if two waves exactly match this same phase so they can actually combine together okay so there is a wave property there is also energy property if they are propagating with the same phase they can combine together and if they are actually opposite by 90 degrees they can actually distract each other so the energy can cancel each other and it become nothing right so this is called as a constructive and destructive interference and as the light is traveling if you look at the cross section if it travels in the same line so what you will see is basically one line this is called as a plane polarized light now if the light if it travels if it is making a circle if you take the cross section and it travels in a circular motion that is called as a circular polarized light so this simple things of light is we need to understand because how they interact with matter can makes things different right now what will happen if an electromagnetic radiation interact with matter so when we say matter it includes stable air living non living everything right so if essentially at a atomic stage atomic molecules and structural level what happens if the light interacts with matter the first simple simplest way it can be there is it can be absorbed as i told it is an energy that this energy can be absorbed by the electrons in the atoms and they can go to excited state right so this is one simplest way the light intensity will get reduced when it basically interacts with the matter the second one reflection so we all use mirrors to see right so this is basically very heavy metals heavy metals are aluminum silver which we use it in making the mirrors so these are very heavy dense atoms that means the electromagnetic radiations when it's they come they gets reflected back so if you have a perfectly smooth mirror that you can actually see all the light that is falling in can be reflected back that's bounce back this is a mirror part right so there are some materials that basically allows the light to propagate but at a different velocity for example the light when it is traveling in the air it is a particular velocity now when it goes into the water it is traveling in a different velocity so this is characterized by something called as a refractive index okay so depending upon the refractive index the light can actually also change in a different way. glass has a refractive index that is different right so this is basically simply characterized by something called as a snell's law and snell's law basically tells you how the light deviates when it is basically gone going from one to higher refractive index so there is something called as a internal reflection okay so if this refractive index is basically goes from a very high to a lower refractive index the light can bend so much it can come back in the same side so this is called as a internal reflection this is commonly used in optical fibers today the optical fibers are used in communications right now the communications what they are doing is that they are actually having this optical fibers that you can actually in the one side add a small light okay so the light gets totally interrupted and it can travel long distance very fast because it's one of the fastest thing that we know right so you can actually use light to communicate that can be one of the very good ones to do right so this you guys should be able to now get it. diamonds look much more bright than the outside environment right so i i don't know you how how it is possibly explained by this refraction principle or So, um, like, let's total the target. Total the target. Brilliant. So, why is that? 
because the it has the highest two properties. Very nice, brilliant. So, like the diamonds, one of the interesting property what we see is a sparkling. But if you look at the elemental fundamental practices, that's the how what is the refractive index? The refractive index is almost 2.42. So that means that the critical uh, critical angle for internal reflection is just 24 degrees. Now, if you see diamond as a rock, they may not be so exciting. But when you polish it, that you make basically side surface in angle greater than 24. So what happens is that when you have light that goes inside that gets continuously internally reflected. So the light that is basically goes in time remains there for a longer time. So it appears brighter than the external pieces. So this is simple uh, understanding of what happens, what is the refractive index and what happens in the light. So as we progressed to, if you see one of the mankind's important achievement after the wheels is actually glass making. So if you see that people learn to make glasses with the very unique surfaces and this is how we started to make lenses. So with the lens you can actually make light deviate or converge. Okay. So you can actually focus a lot of light that is in a place using a lens. So this is this is achievement with using a this kind of a curved surface glasses. Then you can also do the same with also mirror. Again, if you have a curvature of a uh, optic lens, you can actually focus the light onto a specific focal length. So these lenses allow us to modulate the light in our own specifications. Okay. So when we make these glass lenses, we can actually take it into a particular focal point, and this can actually allow us to modulate where the light will fall, where it will get magnified. Okay. Now, this is a second part. Today we want to also understand what happens when there is an image formation, right? So this is just a, any kind of a lens. Now if you basically see the lens, first thing is that you have a focal point for the lens. That is a very specific point where you can actually have the light starting and focus. But if you keep the sap, any image that is away from the focal point, it gets formed in the other side. Okay. So by using this kind of a lens, we can actually form image of a distant object or near object at a different plane. Right? So this things, whatever we are seeing here, it's we are visualizing with our eyes with one lens. We can actually transport this part by having a lens that captures here at a specific distance. So these lenses allow us to transport images to particular direction. Now, Digitization. These images, we would like to make it into a digital information. Many of you have a camera, right? So, I'll, at least you guys all used to a digital camera. Now, can you explain a digital camera to me? I'm sure you all must have gone and bought a digital or at least you would have complained which is a digital camera at your house, right? How can you tell about any digital camera? These days you guys all have camera in your mobile, right? What is the important specification of your mobile? Megapixel. Megapixel. Very nice. So what is this megapixel? What is this megapixels? So let us come to this in one part. See, these are God's own given detectors, right? So, we have a millions of neurons in the back of our eye. So, we are able to generate at least 2K, 4K resolutions, right? Now, this is basically our system. There are these kind of uh, eye system that is in the flies. So, they have basically one cylindrical lens and one neuron at the end of it, okay? So that is equivalent of basically having the light collected by one lens and that is converted into some kind of a signal by one neuron. Okay. Whereas we have multiple millions of neurons that is basically generating the same things. So this is now being done also at a detector's level. 
these are called as the optical detectors so these optical detectors can be again classified as a single pixel or multi pixel okay so when i say single pixel it is basically one surface so we we although i don't know uh, photo multiplic a uh, photo electric effect right there is somebody famous for this one right so this is basically einstein theory that he got up the nobel prize much before the relativity theory that you can have this property of conversion between light and electricity right now there are elements which we are seeing in the displays leds where you put electricity it is generating light there are also other elements which you basically the lights fall on surface of it they generate current electrons now you can use that amount of light falling on the surface you can use it to generate different kind of current and that you can measure to quantitate how much is the intensity at a particular place okay so this is what happening in a digital image you have a multi pixel system is basically a matrix you have a list of pixels in the x axis list of pixels in the y axis so if you have 1000 by 1000 matrix it is a 10 megapixel camera so if you have a 2000 by 2000 matrix you have like higher and higher megapixel camera right now depending upon how many number of individual detectors are there that is a number of and times that you are actually dividing your pictures right so each of this pixel is basically a one light detecting area so depending upon amount of light that is falling on the surface it will convert it to current and that we can digitize okay so in the digital world you always use this zero and one right the digital information is stored in the zero and one so you can have the information that is coming from this kind of camera gets stored in something called as the 8 bit so just a small introduction to zero and one that digital information are stored in terms of bit you can have only zero and one if you have only two bit you can 00 1011 one, right now if you have eight bits the maximum that you can use it to store a number is 255 right so you start from zero the lowest intensity value basically becomes a zero highest intensity value becomes 255 okay so this is how any information the image that is coming it can be followed on a surface of a detector and the detector will basically convert it into a a digital information which we can actually store we can analyze we can put it back play it display it in a overhead projector all kind of things are possible because we are converting that optical information into a digital information so this is one of the key element for us to think about before we start into microscopes i thought you guys will be very familiar with this one telescopes right right so telescopes allows you to visualize some things which are far far away right and so you have two lenses you can actually build telescopes by yourself right yes. you need two lenses and if one has a very large focal number another has a small focal number and if you keep these two lenses at the sum of two focal length then you have a perfect magnification images happening okay so this allows you to basically capture light from afar and put it into your eyes now I don't know how many of you, any of you have telescope? Yes, yes, sir, we, yes. Have. we have. We have. Very nice. Which kind of telescope you have? Refractor or reflector? Reflector. 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 Very nice. So you have this kind of different optical systems where you have one is based on a mirror. Okay. So this Hubble and other telescopes which you probably hear, have must have heard in the newspaper. these are big telescopes that we have put in the space to look into the galaxy so these are all based on mirrors now this big mirror collect light from a very large area and then they can focus into a small area that can be digitized and things like that right so the other version is the most classical one this is how the galileo started it so you have one big lens and the second small lens that allows you to basically 
collect image and put it into your eyes, right? Things far are not so interesting. You need to pay attention to things that are close, right? And this is where the size is matters, right? When I say see the details, right? See the details is basically everything information is is a where is it? Is it moving or not moving? Right? So the location of things is very, very important. That's what eyes allows us to do it, right? You are able to locate things. When you see with your eyes, you can see this is there, that is there, right? You get a physical information of location, right? So that is a one type of information when you see the details. And if these things move, the dynamicity of this information allows you to relate many, many different things, right? So the cells are able to move like this, people are moving in this way. So that is a very important information. Now in this, the dimension part, we have all this bigger things that is going up to 100 micron. We already very readily pay attention to, we observe and learn quite a lot about it. And that's where we need to, things below 100 is also very, very interesting, particularly from a biology perspective, because all the life matter are organized at a cellular level. We call this thing cells, which because these are single unitary, uh, complete uh, independent units, which has ability to reproduce, which has ability to survive, it has energy storage, many single things which we call as the definition of life. And there are many, many types of cells, right? So you have neurons, which can be the length of the whole organism, right? So you can have a single cell which can spanning in meters, but you can also have a single cell which is in micrometers. So for example, you have blood cells, right? Much of our body is functioning because we have this fluidic movement of blood inside our body. So the blood has this RBCs which is carrying the oxygens. We have WBCs in our blood which is protecting us from various bacteria and infection, right? So there are a lot of things that is organized at a cellular level and if we are able to see them, we will be learn much better about them. If we understand things, we can always use it for applications. So one of the first microscope was done by Hook. Robert uh, Hook. Yes. And he Very nice. So he coined the he coined the word cell. And he looked at, probably like you, using simple microscopes to look at what are things under and he looked into magnification. Now if you see this one, this is having a, a small place where you are putting your sample and that time they used just a lamp, okay, the so lamp as a light source and you have a once uh, magnification part which is a single lens which basically magnifies the object, right. Now today we have these things done as a uh, microscopes which you are going to feed, right? Now this microscope, this is optical ray path, I will try to cover in the simplified vision. So these are lenses which with a very small focal length, okay? So 0 0.25, 0 0.5 and so when you have this small objects with a, this kind of focal length, this object gets magnified at a longer distance, okay? And this basically is converted into a parallel with a couple of lenses and that you can actually visualize in your eyes. So when you use this microscope, they look like it's actually 25 centimeter from your eyes after magnification. So the magnification is done by something called as a objective lens. So this is one part which actually is critical in your microscope. Now, you have this objective lens which you magnify the sample and you have two lenses and it allows you to visualize in your eyes, okay. Now, there is also this light because if you don't illuminate the sample, you cannot see because what you are trying to see is a very, very small sample. The information like what we are having here is scattering. For smaller samples, you need to actually provide more light. So this is where you will see that we actually use a 
very bright lamps to basically illuminate the sample. So you illuminate the sample, it gets focused onto the sample and the scattering of the sample is basically magnified using the objective and you can visualize. So this is how typically these arrangements are. In the bottom you have something called as a condenser, you have a sample and you have an objective which basically collects the scattered information from the sample. And that you can actually magnify using the lens and focus into the lens. So, one part very interesting and important is that you can have different, different types of magnifying lenses possible, right? So, this is where that you can see here these objectives that you can have four times magnifications, you can have ten times magnifications, you can have forty times magnification. So depending upon the type of sample that you visualize, you can have different types of magnifying power is also feasible. So there are some other aspects like uh, numerical aperture. So that is basically gives you what is the focal point or how much angle of light it is basically collecting for us to visualize. Now the smaller objectives have a smaller angle of cone. The higher magnification which is 100x which is basically higher angle of light collections. Okay. Let us pause for here one minute. Any, any questions at this point? Are we catching up? So you have a structure of a microscope. Microscope has a stage where you keeping the sample. You have a lens arrangement which allows you to magnify the sample which is we call as a objective and the sample needs to be illuminated with the light. We have this condenser which allows to focus the light onto the sample and this magnified image that you can visualize using your eyepiece. Now one last part in this bright field thing is that these lenses though it now it is looking very easy and simple, but making a very high quality lens is very very interesting and challenging job today. Okay. So when you are hearing about this Hubble and big mirrors, so when you manufacture them, you these are very big objects, have a particular size and curvature. The accuracy with which you have to do is very very high, because the light which is interacting on these lenses are in my nanometers right 400 and 500 nanometers as a wavelength. Now if there is a variation in the size surfaces in microns it will not allow us to get a good reproducibility. So this is where you can see there is some deviations that happens in when we are using this kind of lenses that the light when it is coming from the center it has a one focal point but the light that is coming from the other side can have a different focal point. Okay, so the optical components that needs to be with a very very high position. So that is because the light that is interacting is actually at the submicron level. The precision of the surface is also need to be at the micron resolution. Okay. So the last part of it is just called fluorescence microscopy. Okay. Now, unlike your bright steel systems, you can see here, this is a background is dark and you have some things which are appearing as a bright, right? Bright means that it is actually emitting light. So, the intensity is high, that is why it is appearing as a bright. Now, they are actually having a source where you are actually having the light is coming up. If there is any material you are familiar where they can emit light? Luminescence, many of you guys have watched which basically has the uh, luminescence property, right? What is luminescence? Very good. Very nice. So, you have this light where the one of the function that we saw is that it can be absorbed, right? So, you can actually the materials absorb this light, the electrons go to a higher excited state, right? Now some of this material can release the light little bit delayed that is called phosphorescence. If it is delayed in nano time scale, nanosecond time scales, 
it is called fluorescence fluorescence is a bit like a faster process of uh, phosphorescence where you have the light emission happening much much faster so one interesting thing is it's called as a stoke shift i actually forgot to add uh, electronics time spot that when you actually have this absorption of light it goes to a higher excitation state right and uh, when you are at a higher excitation state some of this energy is lost and when you energy is lost and this remaining energy light comes down then it is actually of longer wavelength so i forgot to mention the energy of electromagnetic radiation is hc by lambda right it is a function of wavelength that longer the wavelength lower the energy x rays smaller wavelength it is very very harmful right so it can burn it can actually make a hole also longer wavelengths they have a lesser energy right now when you have this ele electron absorbing this energy now the information is in the energy it goes up but some energy is lost now the when the reduced energy which is coming out will be of larger wavelength so this is why you have this kind of a property called as a stoke shift that the absorbed wavelength comes out at a larger wavelength okay so this we can actually separate it by using mirrors okay we have one fluorescence system here that we have used one filter and dichroic mirror to separate two different lights okay so here the first process is that it has to be absorbed okay so the absorption we actually send a laser and the laser is a particular wavelength it gets to the higher excited state when it is emitted coming at the higher wavelength you we use a unique filter to separate the excitation and emission okay so this process allows us to look things very very specifically for example this is some bright field in the bright field you have some beads and there are some other fluorescent material inside one but when you go into the fluorescence you don't see everything you only look at the fluorescent object so this gives us to look things very very specifically okay so what is the difference from the normal microscope and fluorescence in the normal microscopes you are looking because the light is hitting the surface and it is getting scattered everything scatters right so scattering is non specific all materials matter scatters different different so that means everything will produce information but with this help of this fluorescence systems only those elements which absorb at a particular wavelength emit at the particular wavelength will give signal so you can look very specific for example this is a cell when you look in the whole cell you can't understand what is there what is not there but if you want to look at only the nucleus of the cell you can label with a specific dye and when you label with a specific dye you can see only the nucleus so this kind of a microscopy can allow you to choose specific look particular object inside the living systems okay so i work on uh, uh, things that move at a molecular level okay so most of us when we are looking at movements of life we can see that when you are actually making a snap of your finger right so that is multiple of muscles that you can actually able to do move right this is usain bolt that was not very good graphics i have done but you can actually see is the fastest person right he can coordinate its muscle to move very very high speed and that's one but what is happening at the molecular level is there are proteins that are called as a molecular proteins molecular motors so these proteins basically are made into a cellular level and the cells contract and relax so this is one of the ways that you can actually have movement of bigger life things but, but even at the smaller things right cells single cells so bacteria have this kind of a things called as a flagella and they are able to navigate in their environment very nicely by driving it in one direction so this is also another types of movement now we try to study them so what we do we we take up these proteins 
we don't take it from humans. We take this protein from chicken. Chicken is easy and we can get it. We separate this motor proteins and we can actually put it onto a glass slide. And in this glass slide, we label these filaments and then I hope you can see this movie. Not So that's hard luck. We could not play these movies. I'll try to. So the movies will try to recover it in some time. That we can actually see this movement of the slide that is happening at a uh, sub resolution using this kind of a microscopic systems. So we do. We have done tracking of this molecular motors. We have done this tracking of the cells. Okay. And uh, oh, okay. This is moving. So I have to listen to this system, right? You can see this small rod shaped cells, these are actually E. coli cells, they have flagella and then they are able to navigate the environment. There are some interesting things we try to study about this behavior. You can see this, this particular cell, you see, I don't know if you have paid attention to the bottom one. One was turning direction and going in another direction. Yes. Huh? See, the single cell organisms can be also intelligent. Huh? So, they have a fantastic mechanism to sense the environment. So, they can see what kind of a gradient of food is there and if the food is there, it goes towards the direction. If there is some kind of a sense, very high pH, some other dangerous things, then it goes away from that other direction. So, these stimulates, they are able to sense and make a decision that this is a direction that I need to flow it on. So these are brilliant intelligent systems and we, this is called as this bacterial flashlight motor. Okay, so this, if you look at a magnified version of this one, this is how this motor is embedded into the cell wall. So this is only 50 nanometers and this 50 nanometers motor can rotate almost at 1400 rotations per second. 1400 rotations per second, I don't know if you can relate it to it, in your, I don't know, some of you have cars and the car you have this RPM, right? You can go up to 4, 5 RPM, that means you are going very high speed. That is rotations per minutes. This is 1400 rotations per second. This is faster than most of the Ferraris of the world. Only in the rocket propellants you can have this kind of rotation speeds. So the biology is doing much, much better than us and there are a lot of things that we had learned from this observing these biological systems. So I hope you will sub keep some time for this. So this is one of our own attempts to look at this flagella, right? Now when you see these things, uh, right, you have the cells moving. But how do you know what, what is propelling the cells? So you have this helical kind of a structure which is propelling the cells that is flagella. Now you want to observe them. You want to basically see how they are moving, right? Flagella is even smaller than the cell. The one thing I missed out is that when you look using this microscopes, you can go below 100 micron. But the smallest you can go is about 200 nanometer. So that means that you can see the cells but not anything less than 200 nanometers. So flagella is only 20 nanometer. We can't see with the, even with the microscope. So you have to label them with this kind of a dye that allows you to look at these cells. So this single movie took us a very very long time. It's only one cell but it's still we made a lot of multiples of efforts to see the labeling of the cells so that you can see how the rotation it is making. The bottom one actually rotates much much correctly. So when you, I am basically, I spend all my time by looking at things below microscope and we try to understand what we can learn, how we can use this microscope. 
and one of the things we started to do is actually also build this microscopes okay so many of this microscopes that today that is available some of the higher end versions are imported and this is where we see that you know this microscopes can be also built in, in india so the, one of the reason was that tuberculosis is actually a, a very challenging problem for india the number of death happening to tuberculosis is highest in india we are number 1 we are number one in the wrong things, right? Yes. We should be number one in many other things, but unfortunately, these are things. But if we find problem, we should actually have try to find solutions. So, when we looked at the problem statement, this was actually the difference between the bright field and fluorescence. Currently, all the microscopy centers, which is called as a dot centers, which is used for TB direction is using a regular fluorescence, regular epi system. In a epi uh, system, the light is scattered by cells, everything is seen, right? So you do not, you have to find specifically the pinkish color tuberculosis cells. And you have to be a little bit careful, you have to pay attention to absorb the cells. And if you have 20, 40 samples in a day, and they all want their results immediately, it can be quite hard, right? So, this is where that the uh, accuracy of these tests are kind of reducing. So, we have now upgraded or changed this into fluorescent systems. Now, we label the cells using fluorescent dyes. That means only if it is a mycobacterium tuberculosis cells, you will be able to see it. So, this way we can actually identify tuberculosis diagnostics. Okay. So, these are basically some work that happening in my own lab. So we will have demos of these things and uh, I, I want to leave this few things for you to think about. All this area is mixture of photonics, right? So light and the light application in biology and other fields are quite, quite fascinating and not many things are happening. And I am sure you are going into your colleges looking at new, new avenues. And this is one of the avenues where you have lots and lots of interesting things are happening. People are building new medical technologies, communication technologies, healthcare technologies, and this can be quite useful. Okay, so it all starts with by looking at a microscope. So, just before I finish, I want to thank. I am actually have uh, we had a huge team which is basically helping to set it up. So you will see that teamwork is the best work. When you work in team, all big problems can be solvable, alright? So, with this, I wish you all a bright life and uh, that's all. Thank you for joining today. So, what we will do, uh, we have four systems which will, okay? We have some samples that we want to set up. Can we do uh, row by row, right? So in that way, four people can come. I want all of you to have your individual time, have this sample and see how these things look like and then we can actually move on, okay? What you can see, right? So this is in the fluorescence mode. So if you see it in the bright field, which is the white light, you have some kind of a circular, very small structures, right? Now you go into the fluorescence. So you can actually see only the beads, not everything. Fun? So this is only the specific fluorescence elimination. So you can see anything that you want label and specifically look at. These are not cells. We have this beads which we know what is the size and we have colored them. So these are used for calibration, right? 
we don't want to put cells with yeah. people so these are artificial samples of known cells that one have a look do dog se dekho You are able to see something? कुछ दिख नहीं रहा नहीं दिखा Make an effort. <laughs> Glasses के ये दो नहीं देते actually. So the lens can focus it on your eyes directly. Yeah, there's like two dots. Multiple of them probably. Just pay attention a little bit more time. Because your eyes are accustomed to bright light, right? So in that you are actually looking in the dark background. You need to accustom your eyes. Oh yeah, now I see. to start from that microscope that is a white field and this one is a bright field this is a laser fluorescence microscope both the eyes take us some time because wo dark mein aapko eyes accustom karne mein thoda time lagega just hang on कुछ दिखा क्या दोनों ऑक्स देख सकते हो पे टेंशन बोथ आइस stay there stay there so this is the same beads in bright field in the bright field you are seeing because of scattering everything is visible but you when you go into the fluorescence mode you can look very specifically what is it put dono aksh dekh lijiye this is only the beads then Thanks for coming. We really enjoyed uh, having this much of people. <laughs> <laughs>